The next thing that we'll talk about is a greater trochanteric pain syndrome. We used to call this hip bursitis, and now we've come up with a fancier name because I guess everybody recognized hip bursitis, and there might be another reason that we'll cover in just a second. But the hip has six primary bursa, and three of those are ones that we really care about. The iliopectineal bursa, which lives underneath the psoas muscle. A lot of times we'll get a clicking or a popping on that, that one. We've got the ischial bursa, uh, where the hamstrings are protected. And then we've got the greater trochanteric bursa, which is um, where the iliotibial band is going to have some protection up against the greater trochanter. These are the three bursa that cause the most problems in the hip. And one of the big ones is this one, the greater trochanteric bursa. As I said, we used to call this bursitis because we thought that this tissue, the bursa, became itis or inflamed. And in fact, here's where that diagnosis belongs, that most of the time bursitis isn't and tendonitis isn't. That another thing that we've learned over the past decade is many things that we thought were chronic inflammations aren't. They're chronic degenerations, and certainly greater trochanteric pain syndrome is not generally an inflamed bursa. In fact, it's generally not an inflamed anything. It's more of a constellation or collection of other problems, of myofascial trigger points within the gluteus medius, sprains and strains of the gluteus medius or of the psoas, uh, irritation to those tendons, you could have some bursitis, but only a handful, single digit percent of patients are going to have true inflammation. And then we're going to have some irritation from the iliotibial band, especially if that band has been tight for an extended period of time and it's compressing that bursa, causing irritation and degeneration. So it's generally greater trochanteric pain syndrome is the new diagnosis. We don't use, use hip bursitis anymore, ever. We use greater trochanteric pain syndrome or a component of greater trochanteric pain syndrome, primarily gluteal tendinopathy, because the gluteus medius is by far the leading contributor toward greater trochanteric pain syndrome. So the gluteus medius, remember, comes off of the iliac crest and inserts down onto the greater trochanter. And that muscle is commonly irritated because it's commonly under prolonged stretch. Now we used to think that this, uh, these muscles would become strained after a long period of time. That the gluteus medius, we consider that a rotator cuff tear of the hip because it's so common. We know that the, the rotator cuff injuries are present about proportionate to your age, that if you're 60 years old, you have a 60% likelihood of having a rotator cuff tear. Does that mean that it's shot and needs surgery? No, rarely is that the case. It means that you have a horse's tail that you've run a butter knife down lengthwise and it can separate, but it's still one piece, it's still functional, and for the majority of those patients, it's not symptomatic. If it is symptomatic, it's usually the underlying functional deficit that's perpetuated that problem. The same thing that caused the tear is causing pain. If we get rid of the cause of the tear, we get rid of the cause of the pain, which in the shoulder is usually prolonged stretch, either from uh, in, inadequate stability or inadequate mobility. But a lot of times it's from a chronic stretch. And that chronic stretch means that the tendon starts to degenerate. The tissues don't like chronic stretch. And the same thing happens in the gluteus medius, that the gluteus medius, that tendon inserts down on the, on the greater trochanter, and it's stretched or compressed all the time. When we're lying in bed on our side, it's compressed. When we're lying in bed on the opposite side, most of the time our leg is dropped over the front, so it's stretched. When we squat, it's being stretched if it's weak, and it's constantly under stretch. So it doesn't become inflamed, it degenerates. And because of that degeneration, it's changing to beef jerky, which means eventually it's going to turn into two pieces or at least start to fray. So these tears of the gluteus medius, ranging from irritation to partial tears to more full thickness tears, are almost identical in their presentation to what's happening in the shoulder of the rotator cuff. And by the way, our management of that has changed as well. That we used to try to get rid of the itis of the shoulder or the itis of the elbow. But when that itis has been there for a long period of time, it's not an itis, it's an osis or an apathy. And in that case, we don't want to suppress inflammation. We want to invite inflammation back. And we do that with things like our lasers or with our shockwave machines, with an instrument or with transverse friction massage or dry needling. All of the things that are showing tremendous merit for those conditions, they're very much related to initiating a controlled inflammatory reaction. And the same is very true of what's happening at the gluteus medius or the greater trochanter.
Now, the etiology of this is oftentimes somebody who's got a couple of years under their belt because it's a degenerative type problem. So middle aged to elder, elderly adults is going to be more common and it's also more common in females. We'll see this is a recurring theme. Why? Because this is probably related to weakness of the gluteus medius and that weakness of the gluteus medius is more common in females. And I don't want to make it sound as though males don't, don't suffer from gluteus medius weakness. They do. In fact, when we survey, when I go into live presentations, and I've surveyed thousands of people over the past decade, for those who assess gluteus medius weakness, which takes a single leg squat and watch does the knee buckle in, for those who assess, I ask them what percent of your patients will, will show an instability or will show weakness of that gluteus medius. And routinely, that answer is somewhere between 70 and 90 percent. And for those of you who do it, I bet you were guessing in the same realm. Most of the time, it is a bilateral problem as far as the greater trochanteric pain syndrome. The weakness is usually bilateral, um, and then the symptoms can become either side. But, but um, in a third of those cases, it will affect one, uh, both sides. Um, a lot of our patients with lower back pain have gluteus medius weakness and tendinopathy and vice versa. That between 25 and 35% of those patients with lower back pain will have glute greater trochanteric pain syndrome, and that's gluteus medius tendinopathy. And it's something that doesn't go away quickly, that more than a third of our patients suffer for that for an extended period of time. So it's crucial that we not only address the symptoms that they're having now, but the underlying cause of those symptoms, including the pre precipitating factors, which would be tightness in the tensor fascia lata and iliotibial band, and the hypertonicity would be in the TFL. The ITB doesn't stretch a whole lot, but the TFL being a muscle, it does, and that's usually caused by hip abductor weakness, that when that muscle is not doing its job, the two above it have to do their job. Foot hyperpronation contributes, flat feet contributes, leg length inequalities, or any dysfunction of the joints in the lower extremity that require a different type of movement pattern. So how does this patient present, our patient with gluteal, greater trochanteric pain syndrome or gluteal tendinopathy? It's usually chronic and persistent. It's pain that happens out in the hip, sometimes radiates towards the buttock, sometimes down into the thigh, and it'll start to limit activity because that patient doesn't like to use that degenerated tissue. So they start walking awkwardly. They especially don't like activities like climbing stairs or higher impact aerobics, prolonged standing, sitting crisscross applesauce or, or running. And we'll talk about how running fits into this. It's not just the pounding, but it's usually the, the biomechanical deficit that caused this problem is perpetuating the problem. When the patient runs, they have an abnormal gait. We'll talk about that in just a second. But first, let's talk about how do we assess a patient to determine do you have greater trochanteric pain syndrome? Well, number one, poke on it. Now, when we press on that trochanter or just slightly above the trochanter at the insertion of the gluteus medius, we're going to see is there tenderness in that area? And if we just poke on every low back pain patient, we'll see that at least a third of them say, ouch, that hurts there. That's a great clue that that patient needs to do a single leg squat to see do you have instability. Chances are, yes, they do. Orthopedically, what we can do again is the bear test. And if I've already played a test, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. I won't replay it, but again, you're welcome to visit chiro.com and, and access any of these videos as part of this class. If you're a subscriber, you're already on board. If you're not a subscriber, click the free trial and check out the videos and prescribe the reports to your patients. The other thing that we'll do unique to this condition is Ober's test. So Ober's test works by having that patient in a sideline position. We're going to take their leg up into full abduction, and then we're going to take their knee back behind them. And we're going to ask that patient to actively lower their leg down behind the other. And what we should see is that the patient is able to drop their knee behind the opposite knee. When they're not able to drop that knee behind the opposite knee, we can suspect that there's some tightness in the muscles that attach onto the iliotibial band. Remember, the ITB doesn't become tight. The muscles, the springs at the top do, the TFL and the gluteus maximus. And most significantly, for our patients with this pain on the outside of their hip, we're going to say, what happens when you squat? Does it look nice where you squat down and your, your leg stays in a good frontal plane alignment? Or does it look like this, that when I ask you to squat on one leg, your knee dives in, there's instability, there's hyperpronation, and hopefully by now you're picking up on those things that make, that make this obvious. This patient has a deficit of hip abductor strength, which is crucial. 
If there's one dysfunction throughout the whole body that contributes to more musculoskeletal conditions than any other, it's this. If there's one test that you need to do consistently more than any other, it's this. Perform a single leg squat and say what happens to that patient's balance and to their knee. So what do we do for this patient who has greater trochanteric pain syndrome? Well, we're going to work out the muscles that have become irritable. So again, we'll be working out the gluteal muscles as you saw in the last slide. That's a um, pretty simple process that we can apply ischemic compression to the area. We can do a pin and stretch to the area. We can do um, some contract relax stretching to the area. Dr. Steele is showing what that muscle does now, which is extension and abduction. He's going to apply some pressure over those trigger points in the gluteus medius and gluteus maximus. And then he's going to have that patient again bring their knee up towards their chest as he's doing a pin and stretch. So he pins the trigger point and he's going to have that patient take their knee up towards their chest now as he strips over the top. That all of our pin and stretches that we, just, that we demonstrate here are real similar. That, let's take the biceps for example, if it has a trigger point, I'm going to shorten the muscle, I'm going to trap the trigger point, and I'm going to extend the muscle as I drag my thumb over the top of that trigger point. And the same thing is true of what's happening in his, in his gluteal um, uh, stripping of that area. The tensor fascia lata, again, you saw this video before too, we just want to make sure that we remember to keep that patient's thigh back in extension so that the knee is dropping behind the opposite knee. The other muscle that we'll need to work out is the piriformis. So the piriformis muscle comes off of the sacrum and attaches again down onto the trochanter. When that muscle is overworked, which it frequently is, when the gluteus medius isn't doing its job, it will develop trigger points. And we're all familiar with that. I'm going to show you this video um, a couple of, couple of um, slides down the line, but we'll definitely want to work the piriformis in our greater trochanteric pain syndrome patients. We'll also send them home with a little homework, like stretching that piriformis. So the, one of my favorite piriformis stretches is to have the patient bring their foot on the inside of their opposite knee, and then we're going to have them traction that knee across their body. So right now she's pulling her knee towards her opposite shoulder, basically, and we're having that patient then push out against the resistance of her hand. Right now she's trying to move her right knee out toward the right. She's going to relax and then traction that hip across her body. And as she's traction that across her body, she's getting a good stretch in the piriformis. Sometimes patients have better success if they prop one knee up. So this is an alternate version of the piriformis where she just brings her knee up to perform that stretch. The other muscle that's going to be tight in so many of these lower chain problems is the psoas. There's a couple of ways to stretch that. This is one of my uh, favorite ways to have that patient stand facing a chair or a table. And right now she's stretching her right hip flexor. She's just lunging forward and then she's going to push that thigh forward against the resistance on the floor and stretch her hip a little forward. So each time she's going to lead with her ASIS, moving it forward as she contracts, relax, and stretch. Contract, relax, and stretch. Another stretch, a great stretch for the piriformis muscle is this quadruped piriformis stretch. So having the patient on all fours, bring one leg, the affected leg, in front of the unaffected leg and reach back with the unaffected leg and lean forward. Right now you can almost feel that stretch in, in the patient's hip. That's a great stretch and sometimes I combine this with a contract relax stretch. And the contract relax is having her push her right leg into the ground and then stretch further forward. Push your right leg into the ground and stretch further forward. And finally, the other things that we want to accomplish for patients with hip abductor weakness and greater trochanteric pain syndrome is strengthening their core. So we're going to give them the same exercises that we did before, the side bridge. We're going to give them hip hinge chair squats, which remember, this is like touching the buttock on the wall, except now she's touching her buttock on the chair. We're teaching her how to engage the gluteus to stand back up again. So she's going to go down and touch her buttock on the chair, and then she's going to come up as though she's on rails, leading with her ASIS in her hips, not using her quads, not leaning forward with her upper body, other than what's needed as a counterbalance. And finally, our greater trochanteric pain syndrome patients, if there's a structural leg length inequality that we can't solve functionally, they may need a heel lift. If they have too many pounds, we need to get a couple of pounds off. A lot of times our athletes, whether it be a cyclist or a runner, um, have issues with what they're, what they're training on. So a cyclist, 
If their uh, seat is positioned too high, that's going to be an issue. Sometimes just dropping that seat down a little bit helps. And one thing that I, that I train my cyclist is to make sure that when they're at full stride that their knee still has a 15 degree or so bend in their knee. We don't want that to lock out. So anytime we get on a bike, whether it be at a spinning class or going outside or at the resort, we want to make sure that we're not getting full extension of the knee because that will certainly cause some irritation of that greater trochanter and certainly of the iliotibial band, which we'll talk about in just a second. We'll also want to make sure that our athletes that are weight-bearing, our runners, are changing shoes every 300 to 500 miles. At that point, the shoe looks good still, but it's no longer supportive, and we want them to avoid running on a banked surface. I'll show you why when we talk about iliotibial band syndrome. I've got a good graphic of that. The other thing is if they're on a circular track, make sure that they're changing directions, not every lap, but at least every day. And if they can increase their step width just a little bit, that's a major help for greater trochanteric pain syndrome and for iliotibial band syndrome. So here's an example of why that's a help. We can see this patient on a treadmill when they have a relatively wide-based gait right here that their left foot is landing outside of midline. That is a shorter distance than this patient whose foot is landing cross midline. And so now this is a longer line that's greater stretch of the gluteus medius, which means it's going to develop more weakness and more compression of that trochanter. So we want to teach our patients to run on the outside of a line. If they can find a white line running down the road, if you don't like them, find a double yellow line. But if you do like them, find a white line on some country road and allow them then to run straddling that line. And it's difficult for a patient who has gluteus medius weakness or greater trochanteric pain syndrome. They're used to having that crossover gait, but as we'll see later, a crossover gait is one of the two big problems with our running athletes. Um, the, uh, th this is a, a good example of the two mechanical deficits that we're looking for. Hip abductor weakness allows their knee to dive in and is stretching this iliotibial band. If I would simply move her knee outward, that would be a shorter iliotibial band or not as much stretch at the tensor fascia lata and gluteus medius at least and our patients who have hyperpronation. The same thing is happening. We're letting their feet and ankles dive in and that diving in is putting greater stretch on those tissues, greater compression of the gluteus uh, medius and its insertion at the greater trochanter, which means more stretch, more ischemia, and more pain for that patient. So the clinical pearls, we need to identify greater trochanteric pain syndrome. <clears throat> We're looking for the functional deficits that go along with that. We're looking for anybody who has growing crease pain. If they have growing crease pain along with it, it might be something bigger going on in the hip. And one of those bigger things that we're, we're thinking about is this one. Our younger patient, our sixth grader or so, they're in the marching band, typically not a fit athlete, but somebody who's a little bit active, maybe inactive and, and has to walk around periodically. And they've got pain over their greater trochanter, but it does radiate toward the groin. In fact, it's gotten so tough over the past few months that now they limp a little bit and they like to rest in this frog-like position in order to provide some relief. When they come into the clinic, we can't get them into any significant degree of internal rotation. What are we thinking on this patient? It's the diagnosis that will steal our license, a skiffy. This patient has a slip capital femoral epiphysis, and here's what that looks like. So here we can see the epiphysis. I like to think of it as a snow cone and a snow cone head, and that snow cone head should sit right on the top, and if it starts to shear off, that hairnet of vascular supply over the top also gets sheared off, and we've got a problem, because the snow cone's gonna melt without vascular supply. And when it melts, nobody's happy except maybe the plaintiff's attorney. So these patients, we need to identify. Any youngster or adolescent with groin crease pain is going to get imaged. I send the images out because I don't want to deal with the growth plates and identify it myself, but what the radiologists are looking for in this case are these particular signs. This is the steel sign here. So when that femoral head rocks back, we see this semicircle or moon that comes down over the femoral neck. When we see that, we know something has rocked. We're also going to look for a, a pseudo-widening of this epiphysis. When there's a pseudo-widening of that area, we're suspicious that something has rocked back. It's opened up in the front. We're also looking for a, uh, a diminished appearance of the head of the femur. That diminished appearance is because it's rocked back, so it looks smaller. And most significantly, we're looking for what happens to this Klein's line here. 
where there should be a line that traverses the edge of that snow cone and the snow cone should be partially chopped off as a result of that. So those are the things that we're looking for at the hip. The next portion of the presentation that we'll talk about is the knee and I hope that you'll join us back in just a few minutes for that. Thanks for watching.